I want to talk to you about something I'm sure is on the forefront of your minds, how to survive a nuclear blast. Now, if you're like most Americans, that is not on the forefront of your minds. You do not think about that very often. And look, I get why. There's a lot of things to worry about in our present world, is there not? This is one extra horrible thing we might want to add to the pile. Uh, perhaps you don't think about it because you think it's just too awful to think about. Perhaps you think it's not likely to happen. Maybe the treaties, maybe the agreements, maybe all of the very sober leaders we have in the international arena will keep from doing it. Maybe you think, well, if North Korea, say, shot a few weapons into the air, we'd be able to shoot them out. I regret to tell you that's probably not the case. You, maybe you think, oh, terrorists would never be able to smuggle a nuclear weapon or get the material, they'd get caught. Well, it's not so clear that that's the case either. What I really want to push back on, though, is an attitude that I've seen a lot of people have, where if I go to them and say, what would you do if a nuclear weapon went off nearby, say, in Manhattan? And they say, well, I wouldn't have to do anything, right? I'd just be dead. <laughs> Which is morbid. Uh, at the same time, it's also a little reassuring, right? You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry. It's out of your control. It's out of your hands. I want to talk to you today about why that's not entirely a uh, true fact, and also why there might be some very good reasons to start thinking about this in a very serious and practical way. I talk to a lot of experts in my job. I talk to people who uh, study the past. I talk to people who study the present. I talk to people who are physicists. I talk to people who are former policymakers. I sometimes talk to present day government bureaucrats who speak under deep, deep confidential. And I can tell you that one of the things that is a recurrent, recurrent theme is that people who study nuclear weapons today actually believe that at the moment, uh, in the early 21st century, we may be more likely to have a nuclear weapon be used in anger than during much of the Cold War. Now, I want to say the consequences would not be the same as the Cold War. That's the only uplifting news I can provide. Uh, the weapons are not as large, typically, as in the Cold War. There's actually fewer of them today than there were, say, in the 60s. What they believe would be more likely is, say, a single weapon going off, or maybe a couple weapons going off. So it's not as world ending as during the Cold War, but the chances might be higher. Research by uh, two of my colleagues, Kristen Carl and Ashley Lytle, uh, who are working with me on this project, has found in a recent national survey, they did this survey in the last few months, that most Americans, a, a, a substantial most there, uh, about 70%, had made little to no effort in their own description in thinking about what they might do in the event of a nuclear uh, bomb going off in some way. And most Americans also report that despite lots of government attempts to communicate along these lines, despite people like myself trying to communicate <laughs> along these lines, uh, that they have never heard any information about what that might be. And this is in spite of the fact that we live in a world where nuclear issues are alive again, for better and worse, right? We have had uh, the emergence of a new nuclear state, our friends North Korea. They have tested a nuclear uh, warhead that was about 10 times as uh, energetic as the Hiroshima bomb successfully. And they have demonstrated a missile capability that could reach anywhere in the United States in about 20, 30 minutes. We also live in a world where if a, a terrorist were able to get a mass of nuclear fuel about this big, they would probably be able to assemble that into a workable weapon. And this is maybe a few kilograms out of uh, roughly a uh, thousand tons of that material that exists worldwide, sometimes in civilian hands, sometimes in military hands. And we also had this reminder last January in which hundreds of thousands of Hawaiians got a text message telling them that there was an incoming ballistic missile and, quote, this is not a drill. And this is a remarkable reminder that we do still live in a nuclear world, that nuclear threats do still exist, and also that there's a great possibility of error in even these very important and complex systems. In this case, it later turned out, it was that the person who authorized this message actually believed that it was real. It was not a technical error, it was a human error. One little mistake, and we had about 40 minutes of terror as a result. People in the Cold War knew more about nuclear weapons than they do today. And you might say, well, that's natural. There were more nuclear threats, more nuclear weapons. 
uh, it's not because it was just in the air. Some of it was because of deliberate education. There was a program known as civil defense that the United States engaged with in the 1950s. And the idea behind civil defense is pretty simple. Military defenses are, if the missile comes, try to shoot the missile, or something along those lines. Civil defense is what you and I do. We're not in the military, we're just regular people. They're the practices and behaviors and steps we can take that might increase our chances for survival in the event of the worst. If you've heard of civil defense at all, it's probably because you've heard of the film Duck and Cover. It's the most famous production. It was one of the earliest productions. It was created in 1952 by Archer Productions for the Federal Civil Defense Administration. It's eight minutes long. It was made to be shown in elementary school classrooms. It centers around a turtle. His name is Bert. And Bert the turtle is very alert. When danger confronts him, he doesn't get hurt because he knows just what to do. And he got an alert. The idea behind the duck and cover film is simple. Get down and cover yourself up. That's what duck and cover means. And it's very easy to laugh at this. And everyone I show the duck and cover film to laughs. And they laugh even if they've never seen it before. They laugh even if they don't know anything about nuclear weapons. They say, well, this can't be right. This can't be real. How is this going to help me? Really, I can survive a nuclear weapon by curling up in the corner and covering my head? What are the odds that that's true? And this is not reinforced if you look at what we have as evidence of what nuclear weapons do. I don't see any schoolyard desks preserved amongst the rubble there with people happily underneath them. It can be very easy to look at the civil defense material and say, well, none of this is of any value. And if you factor in stuff that happens in the later Cold War, we're talking about thousands of weapons, weapons that have uh, hundreds to thousands of times more explosive power than the weapons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, at hundreds of targets across the United States, unleashing radiation everywhere, it's very easy to say, well, okay, ducking and covering over my desk, it's not going to fix this. I get that. And I'd be happy to say there are what we might call diminished returns <laughs> in ducking and covering in such a world. But it's not as stupid as it looks. For its time, it's actually pretty good advice. And its time is the early 1950s. The Soviet Union had a very small arsenal. It had weapons that were of the same caliber and explosive as uh, the ones that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were deliverable by planes. You'd probably get warning of them coming. If we wanted to see what this meant, though, in technical terms, why they recommended this, you may, at your own leisure, visit the nuke map. Uh, this is a website where you can simulate uh, detonation of a nuclear weapon anywhere and see you know, roughly what the models tell you the effects might be. And so I've simulated here, just for tradition's sake, a Hiroshima bomb on Manhattan. New York is always the target of these sorts of things. And it draws a lot of rings, the rings of death. At the very center ring, the yellow, is the fireball. That is an area of immense pressure and immense heat. If that goes off on top of you, you're dead. I'm sorry, there's no, nothing you can do about that. That's the, like, you've been turned into glass. That's, if you want to think about people being vaporized, in there, yeah, sure, you'll be vaporized. Most of the other places you won't. Okay, so we write those couple blocks off. Outside of there, heavy blast damage. Even skyscrapers are going to be heavily damaged. Even heavy concrete buildings are going to be damaged. So that's not a great area for survival either. But you'll see that's actually quite limited relative to the rest of the effects. Medium damage, you can barely see it. It's the gray uh, just inside of the green up there. This is enough to knock down a wooden house, but not knock down a concrete building. This is equivalent to a massive earthquake, for example, or a tsunami, or something like that, a hurricane, or something along those lines. There's also an area in there where you'll get high levels of radioactivity if you're out and about. If you're inside, you can reduce those levels of radioactivity somewhat. The effects of that will depend on whether you get medical care, things of that nature. Now, further out, you get an area where if you're within a line of sight of the fireball, you can get third-degree burns. Pretty bad. But again, you have to be within the line of sight 
to get those. And lastly, you have an area of, shown on here, a very light blast damage, which we're in in Hoboken up there, where the major damage you're going to expect is breaking windows, maybe light things falling over. So you can look at this and say, I don't know, man. This doesn't look that survivable. I'm with you. I understand that. But think about all the areas in here in which your survival is actually somewhat contingent on what you do. So the idea of duck and cover is not that you're going to be under your desk or ducking down and survive in that sort of central, terrible region. A lot of people are going to die if this happens, no matter what. But if you're on the outside of that region, and a lot of people, including Hoboken, is on the outside of that region, doing something simple like getting down or getting behind and not being uh, in, exposed to broken glass or the fireball itself actually can make a difference. And this is why Duck and Cover shows. Here's Tony on his bike, and he sees the flash, and he jumps down behind there. Again, easy to laugh at this, but think about what they're trying to do here. They're trying to create a response so that you don't have to think about it a response that anybody can act upon. We do this all the time. We train children to do lots of things in response to terrible possibilities. The building catching fire, an earthquake if you live in California, a tornado if you're in the Midwest, a tsunami if you're in Japan, uh, an active shooter if you live in the United States. We have lots and lots and lots of training. And we do these for things that are risks in our world, threats that we have. And so the question to ask ourselves is, are nuclear threats part of our world? And if it is, why don't we act like they are? We actually even have some evidence that these kinds of things helped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in fact, this is where the government got a lot of the data from, as sort of unpleasant as that can sound, uh, for talking about what kinds of measures would save your life. Uh, they looked at the, the rates of injury and death from people who were inside a building versus outside, for people who ducked down, for people who stood next to the window. We have this amazing account. This was a survivor's account of Hiroshima. They had been trained to essentially duck and cover whenever they saw a flash, not because they're worried about atomic bombs, nobody knew about those yet, but because that's a good thing to do if you have an explosion in general. So the weapon went off, and he ducked and covered the back of his head, and he survived. No injuries. Now, obviously, he was at a distance in which that was survivable. On the other hand, these people in the car there, they all died. They didn't duck and cover. So this is the kind of response the government was trying to uh, inculcate into young people, with the idea being that you can't teach old people that much. Sorry, old people. But if you teach young people about this, it will actually become part of their world. Today, we're also worried about a threat that was not as big of a deal in the 1950s, became one in the 60s, uh, which is residual radiation, nuclear fallout. It's called fallout because it falls out of the mushroom cloud as it blows around. This is a simulation that the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory did for a roughly Hiroshima-sized bomb going off in Washington, D.C. And you can see that there's an area there in the purple where you have major, major damage. Uh, you're probably not going to survive a lot of that, or if you do, it'll be very lucky. You have the big blue area, which is if you're not next to a window, if you maybe get down, your survivability goes up quite a lot. And then you have this long plume of radiation, which you're not going to be able to see or detect or touch or anything like that. What the government worries about a lot in this situation is that a bomb would go off, and people down around here would say, time to get out of here, head for the hills, and they'd get in their car. And what's going to happen if you get in your car, and it really any day in the Washington, D.C. area or, much, or New York area, but certainly if a weapon has gone off, you're going to get into a traffic jam. It's going to be stuck. Your car offers you no protection from radioactivity. None. What they would like people to do is to resist that instinct, and they want to teach people that. And they've tried to come up with a new phrase, whether it's been successful or not, you know, you can ask that, which is to replace the sort of duck and cover approach, which is very simple, get inside, stay inside. Being an inside a building is always better than being outside a building. And there are certain buildings, if you wanted to learn more about it, where if it's made out of concrete, that's better than being made out of wood. A basement is better than the first floor. If you're in a big building, move to the center of the building. This puts a lot of space and matter between you and the outside, you and the radioactivity. They've done simulations that have shown that if people do the right thing, the difference in lives can range from the tens of thousands to maybe even more, hundreds of thousands, lives saved. And if people do the wrong thing, it's the exact opposite. You've got what they call preventable casualties, people putting themselves in harm's way when they could have avoided it. Nuclear weapons can seem so awful and so terrifying, they can 
blot out our, our ability to think about them. They can seem like the worst possible outcome, and you don't want to go any further. Uh, people get almost a blank spot in their brain when it comes to talking about these sorts of things. And uh, they just seem like something you have no control over, so why worry about it? We have found that when people feel this way about the weapons, they check out of thinking about the politics of them, they check out of thinking about maybe uh, they could have an influence on the world, and they check out in thinking about preparations. Maybe there's some way to find some sort of compromise between the overly saccharine versions of the 1950s and 60s, in which, again, you read a magazine while ever the world burns, and the sort of terrifying, overwhelming nature. Could we find a way to communicate about nuclear weapons that would mix real truths so that people don't feel that you're misleading them, but also give people enough information that in the event of the worst happening, you actually could save many lives. One of the things I really think is underappreciated uh, about this Cold War campaign, though, beyond the sort of immediacy of saving the lives, is the way in which it made nuclear weapons part of the sort of threat landscape that Americans had. Uh, this is a little clip of sound from the duck and cover. It's my favorite clip, just as an aside. Always remember, the flash of an atomic bomb can come at any time, no matter where you may be. Sundays, holidays, vacation time, we must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. No matter where you may be, we must be ready all of the time. Think about how that threat feels to people at this time. In the United States today, people think about this mostly never. And then comes a crisis and we freak out, which can be very dangerous by itself. And then we go back to zero again, not thinking about it. I think that it would be well served for us to think about it a little bit. I don't think it has to be the number one list of you know, things to think about, but thinking it through, what would you really do? Envisioning this as a sort of thing that could actually occur and that you could actually survive can give you a much greater sense of agency and maybe even a little bit more skin in the game. Should we think about reinventing civil defense? I think that it's worth serious consideration. In the 1980s, especially at the end of the Cold War, civil defense essentially went away in the United States. And the consequence of that, and the feeling that, well, we've made it out of the woods, was a whole generation that stopped thinking about nuclear weapons. And I think that might be as dangerous as anything else we've been talking about today. Thank you very much.